Unmute pastor. Unmute pastor. Unmute the pastor's mic. Morning, church. How's everybody doing? If you guys are in the lobby, if you could please make your way in, and uh, let's get going with worship. So thank you, Father God, for today, Lord. We thank you for your mercies and your grace. We thank you for calling us here together to worship you, Lord, in spirit and truth, Lord. We thank you for all that you are and all that you're going to do today. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Life Church come today to worship. Can I get an amen? You see, I, I find it funny sometimes, and you know, sometimes people get excited. Have you ever heard a preacher excited before, right? And then, and then they, they, they may sometimes shout out, and I don't care how you came in. You ever hear that before? Well, I care how you came in. But here's what's more important. I care how you leave. So I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know what might be trying to distract you. I don't know what might be trying to uh, give you uh, 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 discouragement this morning. But I know that I know that I know, can I get an amen? That the Spirit of God is here. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, break through a curse. Can I get an amen from the church? So all I'm going to say this morning, church, is let's respond to what the Spirit is doing. If you need to come up and dance, I guess get uh, get jiggy with it. I don't know. Can you show? But if you need to come up and dance, no, I'm not going to show. <laughs> but if you got to come up and dance, if you got to come to this altar and you got to just lift your hands and just say, God, I give all the problems to you. Come do it, church, because I tell you this: as you do so. I believe his spirit will touch you and you will leave this place the same. Can I get an amen? Thank you, Jesus. God bless you, church. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Still trying to catch my breath. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
Who wants more? Lord, we want more. Lord, we want more of your presence, Lord. We know you're here. We acknowledge that you're here. We follow your lead, Lord, but we just want more. Amen? Just tell them, church, that we want more, Lord. Lord, we want more of you, Lord. More of you. More of you, Lord. More, more. We're waiting here for you, Lord. We're waiting here for you.
given for a hand clap it was given for help to be delivered and so the thing for us to do is to hear what was said and then do it can I say it like this here's what I heard there are victories in the room for people this morning the battle is going to turn for people this morning and what it's going to require is for us to just get beside one another and raise our hands in unity together and hold one another's hands up all across this room and praise Him. That's what the word was. So would you grab your partner's hand next to you across the room? And now let's lift our hands up and start to worship and 
lead us through that song again. Together, we're going to worship. And right where you're at, God's going to release victory. God's going to release answers from heaven in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We're waiting for you, Lord. Hallelujah. Worthy is the Lord. Wonderful. house with praise, all powerful, almighty, we praise your name, O King of kings and Lord of all, he will renew your strength, so wait I say, and wait on you. together everybody worthy all across the room together worthy <laughs> worthy you're worthy oh worthy are you Lord holy are you Lord all powerful sing it How Now let's come into a place of agreement right now. Lord, that in the name of Jesus, you're striking down discouragement right now. And as the word came forth, it says we're tired that you're rebringing refreshing in the place of weariness. Father God, you're causing scales to fall off of our eyes and we're seeing hope where we once saw hopelessness. And where we thought it was an end, now we're getting vision for the future. That everything is changing because we've been obedient to praise you like you instructed us to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can I tell you something you already know? He makes ways where there seems to be no way. He opens up a path and brings water out of rocks and wildernesses. He splits seas open so we can walk through on dry ground. He makes ways where there seems to be no way. Amen. Isn't that good? Well, they're going to lead us in another song, but why don't you turn around and hug somebody and say, you look better than you did a while ago. Oh, come, come to the water, all who are thirsty, come and be filled. Oh, come, come to the river, brothers and sisters, come and be healed, come and be
revival in this place. Yes, All right, we're going to sing it together then. Amen. All right, got to get ready here. I feel something's coming. Let revival come and let the people sing the glory of your name. Be glorified, Lord. Yeah. Let revival come let the people sing The glory of your name. Let revival come. Let the people sing. The glory of your name. The glory of your name. We believe in the kingdom come. We believe in the risen sun. You bring. God is able to save and deliver in Him and restore anything that He wants to. Just as the man who was thrown on the bones of the lion, there's anything that He can do. Just as the stone that was broke in the tomb in the I think we need to I think we need to declare that one more time but I want to hear you guys do it now that we got the lyrics John if you can put that up please my God if you can put that up again we're gonna sing that out but we're gonna declare it right my God here we go I want you guys to sing it with me amen, amen. here we go thank you Lord my God Shout, 
church. Let those dry bones rattle. Hallelujah. Be glorified, Lord. Be glorified in this place. Be magnified. Hallelujah. Give him your highest praise. Give him your highest praise right now, church. Your highest praise. Your highest praise. Open it up, open it up, open the grave, open the grave. <laughs> Somebody's going to be set free today. Somebody's going to be set free today in Jesus' name. If that's you, come on up. Come on up. If that's you, come on up. Be set free in Jesus' name. Come out of that grave. Open the grave. I'm coming out. I'm going to live. I'm going to live again. Open the grave. I'm coming out. I'm going to live. going to live again. Hope in the grave coming out. This is the sound of the dry bone rattling. Give a shout, church. Give a shout, church. Give a shout, church. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. I know you guys don't want to stop, and I don't either, but we have to move on. So let's continue. God bless you guys as you're seated. Praise you, Lord. Amen, amen. Man, when I think of all that the Lord rescued me from, I can, I can praise with that, that he did roll away the stone, that he did come for resurrection life. Thank you, everyone, for being here this Sunday here at Life Church. We are excited to see your smiling faces out there. And if you don't have a smile, you smile just now. <laughs> well, I've got a few announcements uh, for us to, to go over. So the first thing I want to talk about is, ladies, we have an opportunity for you guys to have a fellowship night coming up. They're going to have a painting night. And so um, some of you might be going, a painting night? What are we going to do? We're not going to be painting the walls, no. You're going to be painting a nice, beautiful picture. And you can't see it so great in here, but it's, it's a picture of like a, a truck with a bunch of pumpkins. So some people might look at that and go, oh my goodness, how am I going to paint that? Don't worry, they'll take you step by step right through it. So if you want to get signed up for that, it's Monday, September 20th. Um, please go onto the website and fill out the, uh, the application form. And I believe you can pay for it right there on the, uh, the website as well. Uh, and then the second thing that we have going on is water baptisms. We want to make sure that, uh, we have, that you know that we have water baptisms available right here behind this glass wall. There's actually a baptismal, and we have a heater in it. So it won't be freezing cold. <laughs> but if you're interested in that, again, you can go to the website and sign up for that. We'd like to find out what your interest is um, so that we can make sure that we're walking you through that process. So if, uh, you can sign up either outside in the foyer or you can go online and, and uh, express your interest in that as well. All right. Thank you so much. And I believe Tunde, you have the time. Praise God, church. Somebody shout Hallelujah. Come on, be excited. Be a little more excited. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Okay, it's been a wonderful morning, and I really want to thank Brian and the worship team. That was awesome, okay? And I want to thank Diana for the word. And Rando, this morning, you guys really stirred us up, and the Spirit of the Lord moved in the house. God bless you all in Jesus' name. Okay, church, I've been asked to come and ask you to give to the Lord. But then you don't need anyone to ask you to give to the Lord because that's what you do. I have in life church and I know we have a culture of giving. Amen. We have a culture of giving in the house. People in this church, they give of their resources, of their substances to the Lord. But we want to encourage you to take it one step higher today. Amen. And not just today, next Sunday. And for the rest of this year, one step higher. Amen. One step higher. Okay, did anybody notice anything in the sanctuary this morning? Did you see anything? Yeah. I'm going to call one of the kids. Anybody, anyone from the youth church? Okay, Michael, come quickly. Michael, come quickly. Come and tell me what you see going on in the sanctuary. Thank you, Michael. Good job. I saw that the walls were starting to be painted. Okay, the walls are starting to be painted. So a lot of things are changing in our church. Amen. A lot of things are changing. A lot of life is coming into our church. And, uh, you know, there's this adage they have in my place. It says, 
money is the vehicle of the gospel. Amen. Money is the, what? the vehicle of the gospel. So I'm going to quickly read to you what the Bible says about why we need to give. And then I'm going to encourage you and I to give. Amen. It says in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 12, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. In life, church, we do not compel you to give. You know, Pastor Kim especially does not want to force any of you or myself to give. Amen. But he wants to make sure that we understand the word of the Lord. That it is blessed to give than to receive. Amen. Every time we come into the house, we're coming to receive from the Lord. We're coming to receive good worship. We're coming to receive good air condition. <laughs> Amen. So we have to give to some of those curses. So the air conditioning and all the other things are running fine. And can I give you a testimony? Life Church is doing fine financially. Okay? I don't know, but we're one of those churches in America that have a lot of money in savings. But it's because of you. But the church has a vision for a couple of projects. By December, all these chairs are going to be changed. Amen. We already put in the order for that. And we have a program going to finance it so we don't buy it on credit. And there's a reason we want to change these chairs. Do you know that these chairs are older than some of us in the house? Okay, these chairs have been here for like two decades or less. So we need to change them. We're going to move some of them to the youth church. And if we have a daughter church that is coming up soon, we're going to sow these chairs into their lives so they can start in their own sanctuary with a couple of chairs. Amen. And we're going to sold, sell some of them as well to raise money, to put back into what we're doing, to buy new church, chairs for the church. So I want you to give generously today. Give differently. Give differently. In the book of Malachi, the Bible says, test me in this and see whether I will not open for you the, what? the windows of heaven, the storehouses of heaven, and pour you blessings such that you won't have enough room to contain them. That's the word of the Lord, and it will come to pass today. So I encourage us to give beyond the mayor, beyond mayor today, beyond mayor. I like to give to the Lord in a way that is different. And my wife especially gives more than me, amen. But we've seen what the Lord can do with such giving. We've seen what the Lord can do. I have seen it in my life, okay? I haven't been on salary for the past five years. The second year I came into America fully as a permanent resident, I started my own business. But I've been giving to the Lord, and he has been blessing me in a way that is remarkable. And most of the things that my family buy, we buy cash down. Okay, I have zero credit card debt. Not because of anything, but I have tapped into the secrets of giving. I understand it. So I want to encourage you to live like that. I want to encourage you to live like that. Can you rise up with me this morning as we give in a different way and as your shots go around? I want us to pray. Amen. And I want, I want to ask Pastor Kim to come and pray. The Lord asked me to ask you to come and pray. I know you don't want me to ask you to do that, but he said you should bless the church in a different way. The offering this morning is different. So give by faith. And Papa's blessing is going to come upon the church. The Bible says that there's anointing that flows from the head of Aaron. You know, to his beards and to the skirts of his garment. For there the Lord our God commands his blessing. So he's going to bless us as our Father in the Lord this morning. Amen. As we give. Well, Lord, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And you said in your word, give, and it'll be given back to us. Lord, that's an amazing offer that you've given to us. That we can give to you and for some reason you multiply it back to us and increase our capacity to give more. And Lord, we want to be a giving church, not just in the way of offerings, but the giving of our life, the giving of our time. That we want to sow seed out into this community. We want to sow seed into this building, into this church and steward everything that you've given us very, very well. 
And Father, so I'm praying that this significant moment as Tundi has brought to our attention that as we give today, you will bring financial breakthroughs for people. And Father, that you would release a wave of giving that is reciprocal. As we give to you, you give back to us and that, Lord, you create a dynamo of resources to serve the future. And we give you thanks for it today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you, everybody. It's been a good day so far, right? Man, I mean, dismissed, and we would be okay. I got to tell you, as a pastor, I love that kind of church because that means it's being dependent on the Lord, not upon the man. And that's the kind of church we have to have because everybody knows everybody got a time limit on your life. We have an appointment to jump off this planet at some point in time, and none of us know when we're going to make the jump or come up to the exit ramp. So whatever you want to do for the Lord, do it today. This is the day that the Lord has made. So we're going to pick up in our series called The Genesis Factor. And uh, today we're taking another step in this process called retraining the mind. And I'll come back to that in a minute, but for the sake of our guest, I, I want to just briefly hit the overview of the teaching. And we went back into the book of Genesis, and we saw how Satan set the cycle of bondage up for all of humanity. And it looked something like this. Over on the left-hand side, he created turmoil in the heart of Eve and made her think she wasn't getting her needs met. And she convinced him that God was holding out on her because he knows that in the day you get this, you're going to be like him, and he doesn't want you to be like him, so he's holding back on you, and it created turmoil. Once you get turmoil in your heart, it'll start driving you emotionally, and you'll want to just pursue it after that. And so we know that he lied to her, step number two at the top, and then she, number three, acted on the lie that he said. And then, when she acted on the lie, the lie never produces anything that's true, and only the truth can set you free, so acting on the lie caused her to crash. They sinned against God, and then they went into shame, and they covered themselves up, sowed fig leaves, and went into hiding from God. And then they did the thing that slams the door on the cycle of bondage. They blamed and Adam said, that woman you gave me, God, and he blamed God, and he blamed the woman, and the woman said, the devil made me do it, and she blamed the devil. And they broke this thing called the boundary of responsibility. And rather than taking responsibility, they blamed it, and it locked a cycle of bondage that created a downward spiral, and it was infused by demonic energy after that. And that's the way it works. It's how it always works. It's going to keep working that way. And you can know it works that way, but you can still have it spin on you at any moment. And then we said the way out is to reverse the curse. If you walked into it this way, you turn around and walk out of it. It's that simple. And so you start number one in the middle and deal with that blame issue and come out of denial and you quit blaming others because we learn that blame ties you to the person or the situation. And as long as you're tied to them, you can't go forward. And so you quit blaming and you take personal responsibility. Here's the thing. It, people are to blame sometimes, aren't they? They really do hurt you and wound you. But some point, you've got to decide that you're going to take responsibility for your life and not let them define you anymore. And you're going to say, from this point forward, I'm responsible. I'm not blaming them anymore. God can deal with them. I'm going to go into the future. And so then, number two, you've got to drop down and get rid of that shame. Shame has so many people in isolation and in hiding. 
And you've got to dissolve the shame. And we talked about how to get forgiveness, and we worked through those things. And then number three, to the left, we talked about healing the root cause. That old unmet need that caused the turmoil in the heart has finally got to be dealt with. And we said, the scripture says, repentance is like laying an ax to the root of the tree. And so we dealt a couple of Sundays in that. So today we come to a proactive thing called retraining the mind. Remember Jeremiah said that when you want to bring something new, you have to root out, destroy, throw down, and then build and plant. So those first three things are rooting it out, destroying it, get ready. So now we're ready to start building and planting for the future. And with the first thing we're going to do to rebuild is to change the way that we've been thinking about life and to think about it the way that the Lord wants it to think. And so we've got to retrain the mind. So here's the scripture in Romans 12 too. Don't be conformed to this world or that old way of worldly thinking that we've been functioning by. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be able to prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. That's what you want, right? To live right smack dab in the middle. I apologize to the Spanish translation. I don't know if there's a word for smack or not. But anyway, right in the middle <laughs> of the will of God. That's where you want to live, right in the middle of God's will. Now, let's look at some of these words because, the, first of all, the word proves, it says prove the will of God, is to show that it's genuine. In other words, if you do this, if you work on transforming the mind, it will cause God to genuinely go to work in changing your life. And then to be transformed means to transfigure or move into a different form or shape. It's the Greek word metamorpho, where we get the word metamorphosis, and it depicts a caterpillar that turns into a butterfly. That is a magnificent transformation, that a worm turns into a creature of colorful beauty and has the capacity to fly. And in Christ, we get to become what? New creatures in Christ Jesus. God will release abilities in us we didn't know that we have. And then all of a sudden we're, I heard that song. Sometimes I get goofy stuff happening. While I'm, I can fly higher than an eagle. Yeah. All of a sudden just this, uh, this potential is released in your life. And it renews you, which means it makes you like you're new again. It's a fresh start. It's a do-over. That a renovation in our thinking happens and it helps us make a change for better because we're thinking like God thinks about it rather than how the pain made us think about it. Do you get it? There's a big thing in life. You're going to look at the pain or you're going to look at the purpose of God. You've got to choose. And that's how life is going to work best for you. And so we were conformed to this worldly pattern of thinking, and that's how the enemy developed that addictive mindset. And our, our mind got set on the things that wounded us or the needs that weren't being met, and we created these rules for the road that we would live by based on that pain and struggle, and then we started living all of our lives by those rules, and they never work. They never get us where we want to go. So basically, we're wanting to retrain our thinking from thinking like that to thinking with the mind of Christ or to think like Jesus thinks. And how many of you know sometimes you have to tear down some old monuments of pain before you can build a monument of glory unto the Lord and reconstruct? This morning, I want to take a look at Peter as an example because Peter experiences a personal crash that gets him off track with God's purpose in his life. And Jesus speaks to him in Luke chapter 2 and says, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you're going to deny me three times. Not so, Lord. I'll never deny you. And so all of a sudden, we find this story where Peter actually denied the Lord. He crashes, and he's guilt and shame ridden now. He's not able to function well, and the thing that he does is it starts to create that turmoil and shame in his heart, just like the cycle. And he's asked by this man, you know Jesus, don't you? 
And he, Peter, replies, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him before. The rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. And there it is. He crashed. He had a lie. He, he acted on a piece of information that turned out not to be true for him. And he crashed. And now he goes out. He's moving into hiding. And he's in a very bitter place in his life. And so many of us have found ourselves in there where that old information keeps informing our future. Now he's in the throes of failure and denial of Jesus and he goes out and weeps bitterly. And bitterly means a poignant and violent grief. In other words, it's really tearing at him emotionally with vengeance. He feels like the ultimate failure at this particular time. So what does he do? He plays the old tapes. He goes back to the old way of living. I'm going to go fishing. And that Peter told them, and they said, well, we're going to go with you then. So they went out into the boat, and they worked all night, and they caught nothing. So Peter's off task with the plan of God for his life now, and he's gone back, and the old tapes or the old recordings are playing and he's going back to try and sustenance and meaning in fishing which was where Jesus had called him out of but now he's going back into it to try to find a place of peace in his life and he's catching nothing going back to the old ways is never going to give you anything it's always going to produce nothing for you and so there he is, he's caught in that reality, and Jesus is going to have to help Peter find his way out of that hole and come back into his purpose. So in that little passage, there's four essential truths here in John 21, this how Jesus got Peter back on track with his purpose and his calling in his life. And he's going to help him look at these four important life lessons. They're four important life lessons for us. We really need to get this because it will help us relate to Jesus better. And the first one is, you are not omnipotent, only God is. You've got to go ahead and accept the fact that you are not all-powerful. Now, all of us is in here will say, I know that. Well, then quit acting like it. Because when stuff happens, guess what? We start figuring out what we are going to do without inquiring of the Lord. In fact, we'll make decisions for God, won't we? Some of you are kind of looking at me in that funny kind of way. I hear people pray sometimes, and they're just telling God what he's going to do is what they're doing. By the way, God has a word for you this morning. You're not the boss of me. He just wants you to know that. You're not his boss. <laughs> You see, here's what really happens in life. God has a very simple assignment for all of us, and then we'll complicate the daylights out of it. We'll turn it into more than what he's asking for. And we've got to realize something. We're not all powerful. Just like the word that Diana comes, we'll come to the place where we get tired and weary with it because we're trying to play God in situations and we're not. And because we're trying to use our power to make things happen and we don't have all power. And so at some point we come to the end of ourselves. And Jesus said it like this. Here's a good illustration. You cannot add one cubit to your height by thought. Let me illustrate this to you. I'm going to grow to seven feet tall in front of you. Uh, I'm seven feet tall. It's not happening. You can't add a cubit. You just can't. It just doesn't work that way. And the sooner we get that, it'll help us realize why we need to depend on God so much because he's the one that has the power to make things happen, and we are not all powerful. And that's was what was happening in the garden. He was trying to convince Eve that you'll become like God. And that was the deal. So, when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said, Simon Peter, son of Jonas, do you love me more than these? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, well, then feed my lambs. 
You see, there's the assignment. That's what he wanted him to do the whole time. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He's got to drill this home because if Peter don't get this, he's going to keep fishing. And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, well, then tend my sheep. And then he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Now Peter gets grieved. Now he's touching the point. Now he's got him right there. He's starting to get it. And he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. And you know that I love you. And he said, so, feed my sheep. And so right there we see that Jesus has to move Peter's focus off of himself and move it back over on Jesus because that's where the purpose is. Everybody, I don't know what's going on in everybody's life in here, but I need to tell you, until you shift your focus back on Jesus, you're never going to step into the purpose that's going to fulfill your life because he designed the purpose for you, and he's the only one that can give it to you. Everybody okay? Let's take a little commercial break and just lean over to the person you're sitting next to and say, I'm pretty sure he's talking to you this morning. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the sermon. This is the question that recenters everything for you. Do you love me? So if Jesus wanted to get you back on track, the thing that's going to help you more than anything else is for Jesus to walk up and say, I don't want you to talk to me about what you want to do for me. I want to know if you love me. Because if you love me, then you'll do what I want you to do. And I'll get you on track with what I designed for you. Otherwise, we will stay off track. Do you love me is the most centering question because guess what? Love never fails. And this is the only way that this can work. And Jesus exemplified it in other ways when he said, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. And he who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. And so there basically he's saying it's not a question of whether we love our family or love our children. It's just the fact that if anything else competes with the love for God for our lives, we're going to lose what it is we're looking for because the focus is wrong. The best thing I can do for my wife is to love Jesus first above her. The best thing you can do for your children, the best thing you can do on your job, the best thing you can do in your life and everything is to let everything be centered in how much you love Jesus. Because if you love Jesus, then you'll start thinking like Jesus thinks, and then your mind is going to start being renewed, and you will function differently rather than letting the pain lead you, then Christ can lead you, and it'll move you in a positive direction. Because God designed this thing with Jesus at the center of it all. So the question is, not how much you love yourself, but how much you love Jesus. That's the first and greatest commandment. The second is to love others like yourself. So Peter's expectations of himself were too high because he was ready to fight for Jesus to live when the plan was for Jesus to die. And he thought he would die with Jesus because I'm never going to deny you, Lord. And then he did. And he crashed. And he went into hiding. And shame and grief overtook him. And now he's gone back to his old way. And he wanted to die for Jesus. And Jesus wanted him to feed the sheep. Jesus has never asked you to take his place. Only the Savior can die for your sins. No man's death will do anything for you. And it doesn't mean we don't love him enough that we're willing to die for him. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying only the death of the Savior can make it happen. And only the acceptance of that and that he's not asking you 
to die so that people can be made free. He's asking you whatever it is he's asking you. And in Peter's case, it was, I'm just asking you to feed my sheep, Peter. And if you love me, you're just going to do what I'm asking you to do instead of volunteering to do more sacrificial things that I haven't asked you to do. And this is the crazy thing. It's a good thing to sacrifice. It's a good thing to pay the price. But obedience is better than sacrifice. Jesus had to get him out of the past and get him up in the here and now and to focus on what God's assignment was for his life and where his purpose was. So the first lesson is we are not all powerful. The second one is, and here's a real important one, there is no quick fix. Quick fixes are the language of addiction. So there's not a quick fix. There's a life's journey where we keep growing the whole way and we have highs and lows. You've noticed that sometimes you do better than you do at other times, right? Can I say something to you? I love you. I know you're not going to like this. More pain coming because you live in this world and if your life is going to be lived running for pain, you're going to be a fugitive for the rest of your life. Because Jesus said in this world you will have tribulation. More pain coming. And basically Jesus starts telling him, Peter, you're going to suffer some more in the future. Most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you're old, Peter, you're going to stretch out your hands and somebody else is going to gird you and they're going to carry you where you don't want to go. And this he spoke, signifying by what death Peter would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said, follow me. Wow. How do you follow Jesus? Through the pain, through the victory, through everything. You'll stay in God's purpose as long as you are following the Lord. And so we've got to reprogram our thinking, everybody, that there will be more complications and difficulties in life. They're inescapable. You know what I'm talking about, right? If you don't want something to upset you, then don't get in your car and drive down the street because you'll be aggravated before you get to the next stoplight. There's always someone that's going to get aggravated at what you do and signify to you how they're number one. As you, the enemy will use problems to try to make us look back this way and stall us out in our progress into the future. It's cyclic, remember? It's how it works. So pain, number two, cannot be avoided in this life. We live in a world where God granted humanity free moral agency. And you can have fights in church because people think differently about things. By the way, if you start a fight, you're a sinner. Amen. That's why the Bible says things like don't gossip, don't let there be division. Don't. Why? Because he knows how we will go to things when we get hurt and wounded. And rather than do what Jesus did, we will, and love our enemies and those that despitefully use us, we will go the other way. Right? You didn't say right. Well, it's right because it's in the Bible. And he said you'd have tribulation. Look at it this way. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you like some strange things happen to you. I can't believe how many Christians that I run across, they're going through a hard time and go, I can't believe it. I guess that God doesn't love me. And there he is telling you, this is not strange. This is the world that you live in. It's what happened when sin passed upon it. It affected all creation. And creation isn't redeemed yet. It's groaning, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when glory is revealed, you will be glad with exceeding joy. And if you're reproached in the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. In other words, the reason you get attacked is because of the glory that rests upon you and the enemy would like to put that light out. So when someone says, comes up you, and you Christians are all alike, I'm going, this little light of mine, 
I'm going to let it shine. Yeah, because it's a glory. That's why they're coming at it. They don't want that because it's powerful. And they don't know, the ones that attack us, that we've got it for them. Isn't that good? Everybody doing all right? Kind of wave at me for a minute. Yeah, good to see you. How's mall? All the kids good? Yeah. If you're reproached in the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of God rests on you. On their part, he's blasphemed, but on your part, it's glorified. We've got to see that the purposes are different. On one side, it can turn blasphemous. On the other side, it's glorious. So you've got to look to this side all the time so that glory is always feeding your spirit instead of that old mess that's out there. But let, no, let none of you, but by the way, just in case, don't murder anybody, don't steal, and don't be an evildoer or a busybody in other people's manners because you'll probably have some problems. You know. You know, if you're driving down the road and here's some dude on a motorcycle and he's got chains hanging off of him and you call him an idiot, don't be surprised if he comes after you. Yet if anyone suffers at a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him glorify God in this manner. So this is a new way of thinking. We have to reprogram our thinking and understand that it's not strange that we go through these things. But what we cannot allow those painful moments to do is make us revert back to that old way of thinking and go back there and let it start reinforming our lives once we have escaped it. And this is the good news. There's help, everybody. <laughs> Likewise, the Spirit helps our weaknesses. For we don't know what we ought to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered now he searches the heart knows what is the mind of the spirit is because he makes intercessions for us according to the will of God Isn't that good that the Holy Spirit is there to help rather than respond in anger say Holy Spirit could you lead me right now and pray in the spirit take a minute pray in other tongues you'll pray the perfect will of God in that moment and we know that if we do that all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Man, for whom he, foreknow, he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He's making us like Jesus. He'll take anything and everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and make it serve to develop the image of Jesus into our lives that he might be the firstborn among many brethren or create a lot of them that people that look like him and function and think like him. Moreover, whom he predestined or decided their destiny in advance for, these he called and whom he called he justified, whom he justified, these also he glorified. Can I tell you something? God's got really big plans for our lives. So we've got to accept the fact that the enemy is going to try to keep us from getting these really big plans operating in our lives, and he'll keep trying to revert us back to the old tapes, the old recordings, the old CD, and play it over and over in our mind to stir our turmoil up in our heart over and over again so we won't listen to this guidance and leadership that God has given us in our lives. And here's what it means when it says the Spirit helps. It literally means he bridges the gap. You look it up in the Greek, it means he bridges the gap. The Holy Spirit bridges the gap to conform us to the image of Christ. So here's how it works. The blood of Jesus, the Son of God, he died for our sins. It established a legal contract, a legal standing of what he gave us. However... There are a lot of people, even though legally this belongs to them, they don't experience it and live it in their life. There's a gap between what's been given and whether you use it or not. And the Holy Spirit makes an experiential fact. In other words, he starts working to help our weaknesses that are preventing us from moving it from 
what's legally ours into living out what is ours experientially. So the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit has been given to guide us into all truth. Isn't that good? Amen. I don't think this is a bowl of cereal. I think this is filet mignon right now, y'all. This is tasty. This is good stuff. Hmm. So how does it work? The Holy Spirit is interceding for your weaknesses. He always prays the perfect will of God for your life, and he will always draw you closer to God. Now, the Father legally... Here's his will for our life. Our weaknesses and pain will work for our good if we love him. And it is for us to hear from him our calling and purpose and not to be conformed. Well, it is for us to be conformed to the image of Jesus and become more like Jesus. And that's the will of the Father. So if we face the pain in life with the mind of Christ, under the leading of the Holy Spirit, God will take it, make it bridge the gap to serve his purpose in our lives so that nothing is wasted. i got to stop and say this to you. Some of you have been through some hard things, and you don't want to look at them anymore, but you need to let the Holy Spirit bridge the gap on those things. You need to let him take that pain and make it your servant so it serves the plan and purpose of God in your life. And it will. It will. Everybody okay? Number three. Now, I don't know if you know this. I'm not going to finish this message this morning because I've preached about a quarter of it so far. So I will not hold you here till Jesus comes back. So be relieved. But I'm going to cover these four points. Number three. You are not to compare yourself with others. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple who Jesus loved following, who also had leaned his head on Jesus' breast at the supper, and he said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? And Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, But Lord, what about that man? And Jesus said, if he remains till I come, what is that to you? I told you, follow me. Lord, what about that person that hurt me? What is that to you? Follow me. See, the answer is in the following. It's not in meeting out judgment to someone. They're not going to get you there. Remember we talked about that. You've got to trust them into the hands of God. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. They don't get away with it. They're going to deal with God about it. And you've got to trust that God will do it in a righteous way, whereas we may not. What we've got to do is follow Jesus. And we can't compare ourselves to other selves. Can I tell you one of the most, I'm going to use this word, but I'm using it biblically, one of the most damning thoughts is when people compare themselves to other people. They'll say, well, my marriage isn't like their marriage. And they've got this fantasy thing that they've created in their mind, and for all they know, they may fist fight when they go home. You don't know. Yep. She'll, She's so sweet until she gets behind closed doors. Ow, ow, you don't know. <laughs> I'm just saying. He might be some ogre. Oh, yes, darling, this is what I want to do. Where's my iced tea? The children are running for cover. The dogs don't even want to be in the house. You don't know. So we compare ourselves to other people. Well, I wish I was more like them. No, you don't. You need to be more like the plan that God has for your life. Well, I want to be like that football player. No, you don't. You're not them. You have a different set of gifts and callings that make you uniquely you. God has a hymn that he's put in your heart, and it sounds like this. I've got to be me. It's not a hymn, but you've got to be you. 
You got to be who God made you to be. You're going to be a poor substitute trying to imitate anybody else. You can't do that. Well, they're just so popular. Oh, come on. I'm moving on. Some people are even trapped in this area because they feel like they have to take care of everybody else while they're sabotaging life. You can't fix everybody. And this was Peter's problem. Jesus had some instructions for him that was different than his instructions for John. And that could seem unfair if you look at it in those kind of terms. What about him? And from that point forward, what Jesus was saying to Peter, you just got to focus on following me. You're getting back off track. You're looking at other people again. You're looking at well, whether they get to do something or you don't get to do something. And that's what got even Adam in trouble back there in the beginning. And, the, you know, you're, you're comparing with the knowledge of good and evil. Well, it's good for them. It ought to be good for me. That's a nutty kind of logic. Well, if they can... I can, really, if they can jump off the cliff, so can you. So something is not always can you, it's whether should you. You understand? Everybody okay? Hmm. <laughs> Remember, the blame game will keep you comparing yourself to other people. So here's what the Bible says. We dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. There's one thing you compare yourself to. It's not yourself. Because that leads to pride and self-focus. We compare ourselves to Christ and what he has for us. When you have the biggest train wreck of your life, don't run from Jesus into hiding. Compare yourself to him. Let the mirror of his word reflect the dirt, wash it off, and re-engage. And stay on track with him. So let me say this one more way, and I'll move to the next point. Jesus is saying, when it comes to what other people do in life, the spiritual word is, Nunya. It's nunya business. It's nunya business. That's a Greek word, by the way. No, it's not. But here's what it's going to take ultimately. So you're not omnipotent, right? You can't compare yourself among yourself. But you can spend some time with Jesus. You can follow him. You follow me. And from that point forward, as G Peter made the decision to follow Jesus, and that started to become his lifestyle, he went back into the purpose and became a tremendous apostle who sacrificed himself for Jesus in the future, wrote gospels that we're reading from today, impacted the world that he lived in, but he had to learn not to do all these other things that we've been talking about and to follow Jesus. From that point forward, it became between Jesus and Peter. Can I say this to you? Everything that happens for your life, it's between you and Jesus. It's that simple. If you get it settled there, you're going to be okay. If you get it settled there, he'll tell you what you need. So all the old failures were dealt with. Everything was taken care of. Circumstances and Peter and people were no longer his guide. He just followed Jesus. And the roller coaster rides of up and down starts to smooth out a little bit. Even in the midst of tribulation, steady focused on Jesus. Now this is the same Peter because I want to show you how extreme this can go. This is the same Peter that Jesus had to turn to in Matthew 16, 23, get behind me, Satan, you're an offense to me. For you're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. There it is. You can easily flip over and think with the things of men and not the things of God. 
This is the same Peter who a few verses previously said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So one minute, he's in the heights of revelation and spirit leading. Who do men say that I'm? You're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. Peter, Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. Only the Father could have shown you that. A few verses, a few breaths, and all of a sudden, not so, Lord. You're the devil now. You went right over there, started thinking like the devil. You joined up with the mind of man. One minute you're walking in revelation, the next minute, boom, that quick, you flip over and play the old tapes, the old CDs. We got to get how this thing works, everybody, because the enemy punches your buttons, and the buttons are always those old wounds and old turmoils, and he can poke them just right. It spins. Everybody Okay. <laughs> oh, Lord. Here's the gigantic problem. You can take out the addictive root. You can cut it. But if you don't take care of that addictive mindset, you'll find yourself going back to familiar patterns. You got to change the way you think. We got to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We've got to look to Jesus. Amen. Huh, I wonder if I could finish this. It's only 11.30. Hey, y'all, I got this. I got this. Yeah. I want you to consider how the brain functions so you'll get this. So information comes into you by what you're seeing, right? You're seeing. You can see all kinds of things. You can see joyful things. You can see injustice. You can see meanness. You can see prejudice. You can see everything. And what happens is it comes in through your eyes and it goes up into the part of your brain called the cor cortex. Let me get down here to it. And the cortex is where you evaluate everything and because on what you see and hear, and it'll help you figure out if you're being attacked or you're being threatened by things in life. Now, here's what the problem is. If your brain has been trained according to the pain and the wounds and stuff that you've gone through in life, then that pain will imprint on how you see things. And you will interpret it off of the pain and the wounds and the hurt unless Jesus is leading you. And so then it drops down into the limbic system, which is where emotions get added to the thinking. Now, all of a sudden, you ever had this happen to you? You have, hadn't you? Where you thought back to something, and all of a sudden you're getting emotionally mad about it all over again, even though it was 10 years ago. It's because that filter came through, that painful thought, dropped down into the limbic system, added emotions, and there it is going again. And from there... It'll drop down into your brain stem, which forms another function, which is how you're going to physically react to it. And that's where people's blood pressure starts going up, respiration comes up, they start to shake a little bit, and it's going to be fight or flight. One of the two. And that's how the brain works. And so the enemy knows all this. But here's the good news, that can change. And what I'm going to show you is how you can change it, but it's going to take some work because we got to work to be transformed in our thinking so we can be changed. And Jesus said it like this, if you hold to my teachings, let me tell you, things will happen to you and you're going to have to hold to the teaching because you're going to want to get off of it. Hold to the teaching, then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. There's got to be a decision made Early on in this process where you hold to the truth. Hold means you're going to continue in it, you're going to remain in it, and you're not going to depart, and you're going to stay consistent with what God's Word says. And this is an important revelation because what happened to you, life, is not caused by the problem. It's caused by how you keep thinking about it. The problem happened a long, long time ago. What hasn't happened is us quit thinking about it. So the problem is that we continue to respond on the basis of those things 
those faulty, untrue conclusions, and they feed into the way we process life and what we will or will not commit ourselves to do. So you got to do two things. you got to flesh out all those old lies and all that misbelief that we picked up over the years. And second, we've got to saturate our minds with the truth. And this is called meditation in the Word of God. You've got to have some time in the Word. And what happens is, the script is that we're putting off the old and putting on the new, like the scripture says, Ephesians 4, 22, 24. For you were taught with regard to your former way of life, put off your old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your mind and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So there it is. Those are the choices. They're set out there crystal clear for us. So we're understanding that we're dealing with mindsets. Our mind gets set like concrete on things. And this is what it says in Romans 8, 5. I know I'm going fast, but hang on. For those who live according to the sinful nature have their mind set on what nature or the natural man desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of the sinful man is death. The mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. And there it is. We've got to think on the Word of God. We've got to think according to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And that we need to break that old addictive pattern. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of the world. That's the Genesis factor. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now I'm going to show you how it works now. you got to reprogram what you see because when you see, you're going to do th three things. What you see, you will start talking to yourself about it. Self-statements will start and you will evaluate it and you will develop expectations about it. Isn't that right? I mean, that's what we all do. It's the natural process. We see something, goes to the cortex, and we start thinking. And we'll start talking to us. Well, I don't really like that. Or, you know, or I said, oh, that was really cool. I thought that was really good. You know, and we evaluate. I think I'd like to do that in my life. And that, you know, maybe I could get that done by next week. And I start to create my expectations. And I'm, it's just how I process, right? And we all do those kind of things. It's very important. But we make self-statements. That means there's an inner murmuring or talking that starts to go on. And this is what happens. A negative talk, remember the process of the rain, triggers negative emotions that trigger negative responses. Positive self-talk triggers positive emotions and triggers positive responses. So somehow when we see an injustice, we got to figure out how we're going to talk about it in a positive way like God sees things. Because it doesn't mean God approves of it either. But I'm talking about we got to have a God kind of response or we'll go negative with it. And this is the ABCs of what they call truth therapy. Accept that the old memories will give you a warped perception. If you can just accept that and be done with it, it'd be great. Believe the truth instead of the old lies. And change your perception of the past. That it no longer is your hindrance, but it's going to become your servant to move you into the forward future as God uses it and change your self-talk and it will change your behavior so most people have that so there's two big things that have to be done you got to start meditating in the word which is the word haga murmuring it means to say it over and over you know what that is right meditation it relates to a cow chewing its cud right he chews it gets the juice and nutrients out of it swallows it brings it back up chews it does it again, brings it back up, does it seven times. He's going to get all of it out of it he can for nutrients. And you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on you because he trusts you. And you can trust God. And maybe, here's just a little tool for you. Why don't you start writing down what God's saying to you so you can go back and revisit what he's been talking to you about. Now, we come to this thing called, we start the internal evaluation. And this is the process where you start asking yourself questions based on what you see and emotions start charging in. And this is where you see the rat. Rejection, are you being attacked or being, being threatened? That's the rat. 
if the rat gets loose, you're in trouble. Expectations, then it moves from there to sometimes unrealistic expectations carry very strong emotions. And expectations become problems when they turn into a must. This must happen. Now you put a death sentence on it. Everything crashes unless it happens. And how many of you know everybody doesn't cooperate with you? And cease to extend grace if you do that and you'll start turning judgmental. And you know what the Bible says about being judging things and what measure you judge, it shall be measured unto you. Everybody okay? I'm just showing you how this thing works. So you got to balance your expectation. Here's a good one. How about having a sense of humor for a change, for crying out loud? You're an idiot. Yeah, but I practice at it. Hallelujah. What do I care what they say? I'm not going to base my life on what people say. I've got to base my life on what God says. Have a sense of humor. Sometimes, with, well, it wasn't perfect. That's okay. When you got me as a pastor, the church ceased to be perfect then. It's never, you know, where, where are we going with this kind of stuff? Learn to relax a little bit. You know what the kids used to say? I don't know if they say it anymore, but we used to. Take the chill pill, right? Relax. Give God a chance to do something. Educate yourself about human development. This is just the way people work. Educate yourself about those that are around you. Can I tell you something? I know after 43 years how Cheryl processes things. And I know when communication is over. And I know how she works. This is how she works. I have, if I will force her to a decision now, she won't get there and she will fight me all the way. So I'll say, consider this and pray about it. And this is what I know about her. She really will pray about it. And then about an hour, she'll come back and say, you know, you're always right. And I say, yes, I know that, Cheryl, but no, you understand what I'm saying. I know how she works. I know how she functions. So why am I going to disrupt that? I'm going to take and know how and balance expectations. I don't have to have the answer now. It can wait an hour. It can wait two hours. I can give time for things. You've got to look at life like that. Hmm. Everybody okay? All right. Still got 15 minutes. I told you I could do it. Here's the final thing. So I want to show you what you're going to have to do to stop it. So there are, number one at the top, external events. And then number two, there are internal events, what happens inside of you. So frustrations, irritations, injustices, abuse, you see them and your brain starts you start talking to yourself, evaluating expectations. It starts to get emotionally generated, and you start interpreting, is this a rejection? Is this an attack? Am I being threatened? And now it's all about you. And it will reflux because there are hormones and adrenaline supercharging you. You are a rocket on a launching pad now. And you will reflex. I mean, automatic. Reflex. You will reflex into anger and fear. It will be fight or flight at that moment. <sighs> Somewhere between what you see and the rat, you got to catch it. Because if it gets to the rat, it will run wild and reflex on you. And you will lose the control of that moment. You got to catch it when you're talking to yourself. You got to catch it when you're evaluating. You got to catch it while you're forming expectations. You got to invite the Holy Spirit in. You got to learn to hit the pause button and do some more talking to yourself. Right now, I'm really angry. God help me. Okay. Be angry and sin not. Okay, I can't sin. I can't sin. Love your enemy and do good to those that despitefully. Are you serious? <laughs> but I'm catching it, right? I'm getting informed by the word of God now. He's helping me. He's breaking through. Well, God, it's not right for them to get away with everything. 
Nanya. <laughs> Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. I'm going to deal with this. You can count on it. You can trust me. You need to go on into what I have for you. Well, Lord, my expectation is that they were going to come through on the deal. Well, they didn't. So what are you going to do? Stall out? Or are you still going to pursue me? I know the plans I have for you, plans for good. Are you feeling good right now? No. Well, then that's not the plan. It's to give you hope. Do you have hope right now? No. Well, then that's not the plan. Turn back over here. You've got to catch it when you're seeing it. You've got to catch it when you're talking to yourself and when you're evaluating and your expectations. You've got to listen to it. And is that message that's going on inside of you as it externally comes in and it starts trying to turn internal, you've got to catch it there before it jumps over and turns into a rat on you and runs you nuts. Does that make sense, everybody? <sighs> I just had a deep revelation. I wonder if that's why Cheryl always calls me a rat fink. I don't know. <laughs> we were children of the late 60s and 70s. So there was this big rat creature with hot rod magazines, and his name was Rat Fink. So Cheryl said sometimes, as I tease her and pick at her, she'll go, you're a rat fink. And I said, Cheryl, nobody knows what that is anymore. <laughs> but maybe this is why. Maybe she, you know, I don't know. I'm just teasing. She's watching. I love you. <laughs> Only you can make my heart go round. Oh, yeah. If she's watching, she is cackling on that couch right now. She's got that TV on watching, and she is chuckling. Amen. Ah. I guess what time it is, everybody. 11.46, and I made it through it. Amen. So we had a good time of encounter with the Lord earlier. This kind of message that I'm sharing with you is one that's going to start working as you leave the church. It's going to come up all week long. It's going to come up in your dealings and situations when offenses come when cruelty comes, when meanness comes, and you've got to say, okay, i got to see this right. i got to see it from God's eyes. I've got to make sure I'm making decisions based on the Scripture and not what my supercharged feelings are telling me right now. I don't want this rat to bite me and start the bubonic plague in my life. I've got to catch it. This is the discipline that is required for the renewing of the mind. And remember, healing is cyclic. Victory, 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 plateau. I feel like I'm going backwards, but it turns up again. And you keep adding, 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 adding until you come out of it and you're better. Amen. How many of you by now, you've identified that there are You've identified some things that are that that generated in your life out of that old unmet need. You've, you've seen that. And you see how it challenges you in life from time to time in those old tapes. All I want us to do is to make a commitment today that we are going to get busy retraining how we think. That we're going to get rid of the old tapes, the old CDs, the old podcasts, whatever we're going to call them. When I say tapes, I don't think anybody knows what that is anymore. Maybe they do. I said, how do you listen to Scotch tape? I don't get it, but you know what it means. You have some. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. But we don't want to live by that anymore, everybody. And we want to say, Lord, we want to give him an invitation Renew my mind. Transform the spirit and the attitude of my mind. Transform me to think like Jesus thinks. He endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. But this is a wisdom that comes apart from what this world tries to make us get locked into. 
And earlier we had a word that we're, you don't have to be tired. If we could choose to go on this journey together as a church, I can tell you something. There won't be room for the people out there that need the help that God wants to bring. And it won't be me, it'll be you and me together. It'll be us as a people because we're working on living by the word of God. And we're learning how to say to one another, what are you seeing right now? What are you seeing right now? I'm so mad. Well, what are you seeing? Well, I'm talking to myself like this. And when I evaluated it, this is how a conclusion I come to. And these are the expectations I've had. And none of them are working out real well. What does God say? What does God say? And so you could have come in here this morning and you're right at that place. You're right at that place. You could have come in the door talking to yourself about something. I know how the drill works. I've done this a long time. I've come to the church. I know you won't believe this. I walked in the door as Cheryl and I had an argument in the parking lot and come in and say, good morning, everybody, because I'm your pastor. And I have to pause and go, all right, all right. Because we're just people. We're just perfect. You got that about me, right? I'm just a man. And after 43 years of work, Cheryl and I function real peaceable. She finally figured out how wise I am. It's incredible. I love you. When you're pastoring, there's all kinds of things. You could have just got off the phone, and there's a couple headed for a divorce court. And you got to walk in and say, Good morning, everybody. I just lost my daddy, Pastor. Good morning, everybody. You serve God and you follow Jesus through everything. So you could have come in here with some stuff not going well and you didn't even cause it. It could be decisions that other people are imposing on you and you came in the door talking about it to yourself and nobody would have known it. And you feel like, man, this didn't go on how I wanted it to go at all, evaluating it. My expectations, they're pretty well dashed. I don't have a lot of hope. I'm tired, like the Word said. And the offer was made by the Lord, let's lift one another hands up. And so right there where you're at, just for a moment, just close your eyes with the Lord and start talking to yourself and God. If something's going on, ask Him. So what do you want me to do about this? How do you want me to deal with this? Lord, I'm changing how I'm evaluating it. Rather than the evaluation tools I've been used, I want to know how you evaluate it and what I can do with it. And Lord, my expectation is changing. I'm expecting your help, and that's what I'm expecting now. I'm simplifying. I'm just going to love you like Peter and I'm going to follow you right now. That's what I'm going to do. That's the simplicity. I'm going to let life simplify. That's how I'm going to see it. I'm going to see it simplifying because I'm not going to labor with this and let my emotions drive me crazy. Instead, I'm going to let, listen to it, listen to it. The joy of the Lord is your strength. You hear that? My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into different temptations. Sometimes you count it joy. You don't feel it joy. You count it joy. So it can move in and then God can start to lift your spirit. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.
Thank you, Lord. Lord, our eye, we see that wrath this morning, <laughs> and we're going to stop him. He's not going to gnaw away at the fabric of our lives anymore. We're not going to allow him to keep chewing us up anymore. We're going to move forward into the future. And we're just going to, on purpose, look to you, the author and finisher of our faith, and we're going to worship you right now in Jesus' name. So would you stand with me all over the place, everybody? And let's start to invite him in. And let's just look to him. Look to him right now. Look to him. And as we're worshiping, that may be all you need. But if you do need prayer for something, I want you to slide out and just come up here at the front, and we're going to pray for you this morning. But it can happen back there, too. Let's just worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. If you need prayer, come on up. That would be great. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead. Thank you, Jesus. lifted up. God with all my heart 
And when I talk to myself, I'm going to speak your word, Father. And I'm going to say what you say. And you say, I am more than a conqueror <laughs> through Christ who strengthens me. I'm going to say that you have sent me a helper that will guide me into all truth and comfort me. I'm going to say that you've triumphed over the enemy and crushed him openly. I'm going to say what you say. I'm going to evaluate circumstances with a step of faith that no matter how bleak it looks, I'm going to declare that you're the prince of life and yet you make a way where there seems to be no way. I'm going to say my expectation is in the Lord and my confidence is not in the flesh, it's not in what people can do, but it's in a God that makes a way where there seems to be no way. I'm going to say that you are the King of kings and that you are the Lord of lords and that you are the Lord of glory and that you and you alone are worthy of my praise and my attention. I glorify you, God, in Jesus' name. We are not defeated. We are victorious. We are his people. We are the apple of his eye. He has chosen us. We are his beloved in spite of what this world says. We are whom he says we are. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's worship him with all of our hearts. walk out of here. Yep. Yep. Around delivery. Listen to this word. Thank you, Lord. You know, God speaks pieces to different people, and Lord just put this on my heart to follow up. Uh, what Diana said is so true, God. If think about that picture for just a minute. Aaron, and, I'm, uh, sorry, uh, Moses is up on the mountain, and Aaron and her are holding up his arms. And by the way, Moses was sitting down. He was so tired. He was sitting down, and Aaron and her were on either side of him holding up his arms. But who was fighting the actual battle? Did you guys catch that? She mentioned it. It was Joshua. He was down in the valley. He was leading the troops of Israel to fight against the Amalekites. So when we are tired, you know what? It's okay to sit down sometimes and to get people holding up your arms. And understand it's not just you fighting that battle. In fact, you might not be the one fighting the battle. You might be the one resting. But it's the, your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's the people of your community who are fighting that battle for you sometimes and along with you sometimes. Our goal is to do what Moses did. Just keep your hands up and keep focusing your eyes on the Lord. Thank you. Amen. Oh, by the way, the Amalekites were utterly destroyed. Yeah. They built an altar to God to remember that they were totally destroyed. Amen. Utterly destroyed means it was done once and for all. That's good. So we got to see ourselves like God sees us, right? So before we go, you have a word? Everybody, but um, it's really been put on my heart just hearing the awesome sermon that you preached. And I feel like there's people here that are facing Goliaths in their life. They feel like it's bigger than them. 
and they don't know how to defeat it. And what I kept getting in my mind was, you glance at the Goliath, but you gaze at God. So no matter how hard things get, you don't know how to navigate, if you can just keep those words in your mind of just glance at the Goliath and just keep gazing at God and he will show you the path to keep following. Amen. Amen. So I want us to make a confession together and see ourselves like he sees. So together as a community, let's say this. You repeat it after me. I'm the head, not the tail. I'm above only and not beneath. God will bless my bread basket and storehouse. He'll bless everything I set my hand to and he'll cause it to prosper. The enemy will come against me one way and he will flee from me seven ways. I'm gonna dwell in the house of the Lord forever and of the increase of his kingdom there shall be no end. And I am a part of that kingdom. In Jesus' name. Isn't that good? That's good. Give somebody a high five. Mike's going to come and dismiss us this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Have you guys been blessed by the word this morning? Amen. Have you received your touch from God this morning? Amen. If you're joining us for the first time, we want to thank you for joining us. It was a pleasure and an honor to worship God with you this morning. If it's your first time on your way out, Pastor Kim will be in the lobby. He would love to meet you. He would love to shake your hand and thank you personally for coming to Life Church. But we would just want to pray blessing over you guys this week. We pray that the Lord will bless you, the Lord will keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. So on the way out this, this morning, we had a chance to thank God for the week before. And, and I heard someone say, when you thank God after the fact, we call it gratitude. But when we thank God before he does something, we call it faith. So on the way out this morning, can we walk in faith, thanking him for the things that he is going to do in the week to come. Amen. So we thank you, Lord, and let's thank the Lord this morning and sing some praise on the way out. In Jesus' name, amen. Look the mountain, I walk the street.